Hello, I'm Max Cameron uh, in the Department of Political Science uh, here at UBC, and I'm joined by Afsun Afsahi, also in the Department of Political Science. And we thought we'd get together today to have a conversation um, about some of the work that we're doing. Uh, both of us have an interest in, I suppose, what might be called uh, applied ethics or applied political theory. And we've both recently published uh, work that uh, we're keen to share with you. Um, the work that I have been doing is around a program to prepare people for public life, the Institute for Future Legislators. And we just published an article in the journal Political Science Education uh, about um, partisanship and political learning. Uh, Afsun, would you like to say a word or two about yourself and your work before we begin the conversation? Well, hello, everyone. Um, so um, I think Max did a wonderful job of kind of uh, describing the kind of work that we do that is very similar, uh, which centers around um, trying to bring theory to speak to the practice of democracy and using the practice of democracy to strengthen the, the theories of democracy that we have. So I recently published an article in Political Studies that looks at deliberation um, in terms of the ways in which people tap into their own self-interest to actually make deliberation better. And I talk about the ways in which we can actually use this self-interest and tap into this self-interest by designing various kinds of games to get people to learn the rules of deliberation as part of a game and to help smooth out the process of talking about difficult issues together in society. That's great. So could you maybe uh, start us off by um, saying a little bit about the ways in which citizens who, who often have diverse and conflicting political and, and moral commitments can come together and talk about political issues? What does your research say about this problem? Uh, well, thanks, Max. I think um, the key thing that my research tells us is that when we think about good dialogue, good deliberation, one that is respectful and reflective and constructive, what I've come to realize is that this kind of um, dialogue really needs to be planned and designed properly. It needs to be facilitated and needs to really be aware of the structural inequalities and differences that exist outside of deliberation. Because if we are not aware of those, and if we're not properly mitigating those, through proper design, through proper facilitation and the use of games, these inequalities and, uh, and injustices tend to replicate themselves within the deliberative setting themselves. But when these conversations are properly designed, when there is facilitation, skillful facilitation, that can guide the dialogue. In doing so, it makes the dialogue constructive, Facilitators can help participants to remember the rules of the game, the rules of the conversation by remaining respectful and civil to one another. Facilitators can call, for example, participants out if they're talking too much. And in doing so, if we can find ways to get people to talk to each other and reduce ad hominem arguments, stereotyping, personal attacks, deception, withholding of information, then we can have conversations uh, about difficult issues in ways that can, you know, um, bring people together and allow them to see past their kind of conflicting personal and moral commitments. So this is basically the kind of crux of, uh, like the kind of question that I am interested in my research. And I know that you have a lot of interest in how this kind of uh, can like translate into real world politics, how we can get people who are interested in becoming politicians to learn how they can do the work better. So I actually have a kind of question for you in that sense, which is, I know that you have a lot of interest in this idea of practical wisdom and learning by doing, which is similar to the kind of work that I do. So I'm wondering why you think practical wisdom is necessary to navigate pluralism in society, especially when it comes to the kind of differences in moral commitments and values 
and how you think this Institute of Future Legislatures and their participants can kind of learn to become wise practitioners. Well, the, the idea of uh, practical wisdom goes back to the political theory of, of Aristotle in the fourth century BC, particularly in his work on ethics. And uh, Aristotle saw practical wisdom as the, the, the ability, the, the, the skill, the will to do the right thing and to, to do the right thing in particular situations in the right way, in the right time, and, and for the right reasons. And that can sound a little bit sort of uh, airy fairy. Um, but when we, he, but that Aristotle suggested that one of the things that we can do if we want to um, see practical wisdom is, is look for exemplars, look for people who in their own lives flourish and appear to do well. And what we often find is that they have qualities of a good judgment, of the ability to exercise wise discretion, the ability to deliberate well with others. And um, he argued that this kind of capacity, something that we all have, we all possess the potential to be wise practitioners, but it needs to be cultivated. And it's cultivated through practice, through learning by doing through experience. So for example, if you think about someone who is a, an excellent doctor or nurse mm -hmm. or lawyer or teacher or firefighter or soldier, mostly what these practitioners have learned, they've learned through hard earned experience. And the same is true in everyday life, in our friendships, we need practical wisdom to be good friends. We need practical wisdom to know how to spend our leisure time well. We also need it in our politics. And so part of the purpose of the program that we've established here at UBC to train people for politics begins with the assumption that people go into politics often for very good reasons. They're committed to their community. They're committed to a cause or, or, or some, uh, some value that they have. But they're often corrupted by the practice itself. And so we wondered, is there some way of providing people with an opportunity to gain practical, experiential knowledge of politics before they enter into the political arena. And so we created this program in which we run a series of boot camps, and then we run a parliamentary simulation. And one of the interesting things that we found goes right to your point about how often deliberation replicates some of the problems that we see uh, in, in society in terms of uh, inequalities um, in terms of injustices and so forth. And, and so, for example, in our case, our, our legislators in uh, simulating legislative debates often engaged in the same kind of toxic polarization and excessive partisanship that we see in our parliaments and we see in parliaments around the world. And the participants themselves noticed this and we noticed it. And so we began to ask, how could we improve the practice? And we introduced something that's really very similar to what you have shown in your work when you do simulations, good facilitation and opportunities for reflection where people pull back from the activity and think about what they're doing, reflect on what they're seeing, and ultimately try to make a decision about the kind of practitioner that they wish to be. And what we report in the paper that we've just published is the transformative effect that something as simple as well-facilitated um, reflective dialogues uh, can have on the deliberative uh, process. And I think this goes to something that I know is a, is a real uh, interest of, of your own, uh, which is that as we engage and talk in deliberation, um, how do we overcome the tendency for inequalities and, and, and injustices to be uh, to, to persist. So I'd like to hear your reflections as well on what we can do to make deliberation more meaningful. Yeah, uh, very uh, interesting, Max. And it just, as, as you were uh, talking, it just reminded me of all these kinds of examples of real world debates on deeply divisive issues that got me interested in thinking about 
how we can how we can navigate diversity and to overcome the effect of inequalities in deliberations. And the two that I think particularly motivated me that speak to the work that you do are the Sharia law debate in Ontario and the Reasonable Accommodation Com uh, Commission headed by Charles Taylor and Gerard Richard in Quebec. And both of those commissions were experiments on what it would look like if we included the citizenry in conversations about accommodation of religious and cultural minorities in a multicultural country like Canada. And I think both of these examples of large scale debates on these issues were particularly interesting and also disheartening to a great extent because of the fact that they ended up replicating the exact same power inequalities that existed in society. So in both cases, not only were the voices of the cultural and religious minorities oftentimes silenced, as I study one of the cases very closely in one of my uh, other articles, but both of these experiments in citizen deliberation and consultation led to the highlighting and dispersing of deeply racist and bigoted statements by individuals. And there was really no conversation back and forth. There was no attempt to, at mutual understanding. There was no attempt at mutual learning. People did not walk away while still disagreeing, respecting the positions of the other side, at least respecting the fact that they had a right to hold different positions from them. And a lot of research has also shown that in deliberation-like settings, people who have more you know, social, political, economic power in society behave very differently in deliberation. So a really good example of it is that if we look at, for example, um, examples of like set up mini publics men oftentimes walk or talk more than women they interrupt women more often and it's not just these kinds of mini publics we see the same thing in legislatures the difference between male and female politicians and we see it again in in one of the most kind of interesting examples is uh coming out of the united states supreme court where even female justices on average were interrupted more, not by their colleagues, but also by petitioners to the court. So this is a kind of common behavior uh, that happens when we are not, as you said, being reflective about the way that we do things and we just do things. And so one of the key things that I think is important in order to ensure that we can have conversations that do not end up replicating the exact inequalities is that we need to build into our conversations the ability for the participants, the interlocutors, to take a moment back, to reflect, and to pay attention to not just what they are saying, but how they are saying how they're interacting with each other. Because it's not just important that you believe in position X or I believe in position Y, but that what steps do we take in order to get our message across? So I have talked quite a lot about um, facilitation as being very important, um, but there are other specific measures that we can also take um, that I, I would be very happy to talk about. But I, I actually at this point have a question for you, Max, which is, I think if we think about how we can take the lessons that I have learned in my research and the work that you have done in the Institute for Future Legislatures and your broader research on practical wisdom, the question then becomes, if we want to have an egalitarian democratic society, which I think we are all interested in having, no matter what kind of moral and political commitments we have, what kind of citizens and politicians do we need in order to have that just and egalitarian society? And what kind of qualities and characteristics are we after that we are trying to, like that we should be trying to cultivate and that you've been trying to cultivate in the Institute for Future Legislature? Well, thank you. I think that's a really important question. And, and it's a question that I think in some ways, although you and I start from slightly different positions, we really land uh, in the same or very similar kind of place. And that I think um, I would argue that um, there, there's little point to philosophizing about uh, 
ideas like justice or, or equality or citizenship, if people aren't motivated to pursue justice and equality and citizenship. And so um, where a lot of the kind of intellectual tradition that I come from, which is sometimes referred to, it's not a term that I, I like, it's not, it's a bit misleading, but it's often called virtue ethics, um, begins with the recognition that our theories of ethics need to be grounded somehow in an understanding of who we really are as human beings and what we strive for and what enables us to live good lives and to, and to flourish uh, collectively. And uh, one of the basic ideas that um, Aristotle argued many years ago uh, was that it is very difficult to pursue any vision of the good or justice or citizenship or democracy, unless we have the disposition to do so. And so a big challenge uh, for me in training politicians is that when we recruit people into our program, um, we've, we've, we get a real mix of people, some of whom are really keen to win and, and, and occupy public office and to use that uh, to um, achieve a kind of a position of leadership in their community, to stand out and to excel. And that's not all bad necessarily. Some of that motivates people to, to act and that, that can be positive. But we also want people who approach politics with humility and a desire uh, to serve and who are conscious of the um, values um, and, and the aims of, of the activity and are keen to be able to, for example, find uh, common ground, to be able to make compromises to get things done, not compromises that put at um, risk their own most cherished principles, but compromises that advance what's good for them and for their community, given that we know that we have sharp disagreements, we have multiple political parties, and those parties represent different values and, and, and different interests. And so our belief is that giving people the opportunity to cultivate the practices of democracy, which include things like good deliberation, uh, but also exercising wise discretion and good judgment, um, listening carefully to others, learning to empathize with others, uh, being a good storyteller, being able to capture what motivates other people and to be able to articulate that in a way that is compelling and that finds common ground, that those are, are important things to do. Now, some people at the end of the day are not motivated by this, but one of the things that we believe is that most people who go into politics do go into it often for the right reasons. But learning how to perform those practices is a real challenge. I'll give you an example. We had a participant several years ago um, from First Nations community, so very ambivalent about participating in what she regarded as our colonial parliamentary institutions. And yet she believed that it was important to participate in order to advance the interests of her, uh, of her community. But she was ambivalent um, and, and tended to second guess herself. She expressed a desire to play uh, uh, an active role in the simulations, but we saw her from time to time pulling back from that. And one of our facilitators talked to her and said, why aren't you stepping up more? What's holding you back? And that just that question encouraged her to step up a little bit more. And we had a fascinating reflection with her about under what conditions one should step up and when should one not. And our facilitator uh, said something that I thought was really quite powerful, which is, you can either step up and play a leadership role when you feel that there's a need, your community needs to be served, or not. But if you don't step up, then get behind somebody else. There are strategies that you can employ to ensure that you get the results for your community that you want, even if you're not comfortable in stepping up. And so just figuring out the kind of roles that people are really comfortable with, that's something that you can learn um, through, through practice. 
I guess one of the things that we're really both grappling with in one way or another is we're interested in deliberation and we believe in the possibility that deliberation can get us to a better place that we can find common ground across a range of diverse viewpoints. Um, and the challenge really is to bypass or to find ways of attenuating some of the structural inequalities and in injustices uh, that, that, that tend to derail good deliberation. And, and I'd like to hear you return to, to the question of what are some of the specific measures that you have found effective in doing that? Okay. Um, well, thank you for the question, Max. I think it's uh, really kind of cool that you talk about this particular disposition that you need to be able to commit yourself to doing politics differently. And it's it's interesting because one of the key questions that I have been interested in is when we have you know these inequalities and injustices when there is no mutual trust between people because of you know the experience of politics and economics and basically society that is fraught with inequalities and injustices what guarantee do we have that we can get participants to behave differently in the deliberation and one of the kind of uh, the ideas that always interested me, what interested me in this uh, issue was James Bowman a few years ago wrote an article drawing from Aristotle who asked, when the water chokes, what is one to wash it down with? So when we have these inequalities uh, and these inequalities manifest themselves in people's interactions with each other, thinking that we can somehow fix the inequalities by having more interactions just seems nonsensical. So James Bowman was interested in find, like figuring out what kind of dispositions do pe people need and how can we cultivate them? And this is where I come in with my specific measures. I've talked a lot in our conversation today about the importance of facilitation, but my work has also shown that facilitation itself has limitations. So I'll give you uh, an example of what I mean. I ran a series of experiments looking at the kind of dynamics of deliberation, how people talk to each other on a deeply divisive issue. And I picked religious arbitration in British Columbia as that issue, having been inspired by how wonderful the Sharia law debate uh, proceeded in Ontario. So the first, for the first round of deliberations which were under control conditions, I had facilitators who were very well trained in their craft and they were in, able to ensure the overall quality of deliberation and, and to make sure that overall deliberation was respectful and reflective and constructive. But still somewhere around 40% of interactions from participants still suffered from what we would call negative deliberate behaviors or divestment. So people still went back to their kind of disposition of trying to win the argument, not listening to each other, trying to cut each other off or pushing others towards a false consensus. So what I did for the rest of the deliberations because I was trying to figure out specific measures was that I designed two different games. And what I really liked about these about these games is that much like other games, they mimic or create artificial con uh, conflict, but within a set of rules and limitations. So games can make people become very aware of the behavior that they have. It makes them reflective of the behavior that they have, but games also kind of impose procedural fairness. You want to engage in fair play and not spoil the game. What I particularly liked about these games was that they made the process of deliberation a bit more fun, but got participants to reflect on the rules of deliberation and got them to kind of uh, embed those rules within themselves. So they became reflective about the way that they were talking to one another. And most importantly, they tapped into this kind of self-interest that the participants had, which was to basically come on top. But it kind of switched it or turned it on its head. So for one of the kind of the games that I did, uh, and I'll only speak to one of them uh, for, for purposes of not going on for too long. One of the kind of games that I did uh, what is what I call deliberative worth exercises. So after participants uh, deliberated, one of the things that I told them from the beginning was that at the end of each round of deliberation, I wanted it to take, to take a few moments 
and to think about the way that they interacted with one another and to pick the person they thought best followed the rules of fair game. So waited their own turn, reflected on what, what was being said, built on other people's arguments, tried to find, find common ground. And they would write down the name and give it to the facilitator who would then share it with the group. So one of the things that I found that this game could address was the possibility and the tendency of participants to forget about the norms and rules of deliberation. So this game got participants to remain reflective and vigilant about the way that they were interacting with other people in the deliberation. And of course, self-interest played a big role in this case because there's a self-interested impulse to be seen positively by others, to win the game, to be acknowledged publicly as the participant who did the best in following the rules of the game. And so it led everyone to really behave differently towards one another in a genuine way. So all those the effects of all these inequalities and injustices that usually mar deliberation just disappeared. Participants cared as much about what they were saying as they as how they were saying it, how they were interacting with each other. And it was really effective at reducing these the effects of inequality and structural injustice, because it was teaching participants as part of doing deliberation, how to deliberate better. So basically practical wisdom, how they could do this. And it was very interesting to me because what I was focused on was how to tap into self interest in order to get participants to get the right disposition to think about common ground, which is, it almost seems uh, counterintuitive to try, try to get people to think about themselves in order to think about how they can make the dialogue better for everyone, which really leads me to think about the kind of work that you do at this kind of school for politicians. So you talk a lot about the disposition needed to find common ground, how we can do that, and of course, we go into politics, lots of people go into politics for good reasons, but then it becomes difficult because the rules of the game are set up in a, dip, in a way that leads people to behave a certain way. Politics, the way that we have set it up is overly competitive, it's winner take all, it, it's created in a way where conflict re is rewarded as opposed to finding common ground. So you talk a lot about how we can kind of cultivate through reflective dialogue, this common ground, but it makes me think about whether or not there is a role uh, about common good in politics. Like if you can think about whether or not there is a common good, how we can discover it, and whether or not the, the Institute for Future Legislatures or School for Politicians contributes to this key aim of whether or not we can move from common ground to a common good. Well, so, thank you very much, Asuna. I love your example of the deliberative worth exercise and the idea of investment in the deliberative process and the way in which we can design deliberation to really draw that out using people's own self-interest, but in aid of achieving a better quality of deliberation. It's a marvelous example, and I'd love to try to use some of these exercises in our, uh, in our Institute for, 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 for Legislators. Um, you know, I, I am very much motivated by the idea that the common good is incredibly important in politics. And yet uh, in our highly market driven um, capitalist uh, system, the economy and, 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 and a social, social system, um, we put a very strong emphasis on um, self-interest and, and on incentives and rules that are designed to encourage people to be competitive, to maximize their utility as individuals, as opposed to um, pursuing the intrinsic aim of the activity that they're involved in. Earlier, I said that if you want to know what practical wisdom is, look for an example of a wise practitioner, look for a great example of someone you admire, a teacher you admire, a parent, uh, a doctor, um, uh, it could be um, a, an employee or, an, or, or, or even an organization. Um, and I think what you find in those exemplars of practical wisdom is a commitment to the intrinsic aims of the activity. So a good doctor will, of course, be someone who 
is pursuing their own self-interest, their own professional advancement. But they do it by providing this critical service of healthcare um, to, to the public. A good teacher, again, uh, we have a variety of reasons for, for teaching, but we're deeply committed to our students. We want to see our students thrive. We want to see them learn in almost any profession and certainly in many activities. The intrinsic aim of the activity is to provide some good and great professionals, great practitioners focus on that intrinsic aim, even as they are advancing their own self-interest. Um, Aristotle never really made much of a distinction between self-interest and the interest of the community. It was about doing what's good for you and your community um, simultaneously. Those two things do tend to get bound together in ways that we, we don't always acknowledge. So for example, think of a, think of a shrewd businessman who creates a spot Ponzi scheme and gets rich. I don't think many of us would regard that person as having moral worth. Um, that's not something, somebody who would be an exemplar of practical wisdom. That would be somebody who is shrewd, but not, not wise. The wise practitioner never loses sight of the importance of the intrinsic aim of the activity that they're involved in. And so our goal is to say, what would be that intrinsic aim in politics? And that's a hard one, because as you know, politics is competitive. It is a blood sport. People um, uh, go, go into an arena in which they are often on the attack. And what we want to try to do with our program is step back from that and remember the intrinsic aim of politics isn't simply to uh, or, or beat your opponent, uh, to form government for the sake of forming government. It is, it is to serve your community. As Hannah Arendt said, when, whenever we ask the question, what are we to do? We're asking an intrinsically political question. It's about how as a community we can move forward and, and trying to remind people that that's the aim of politics. It's part of, of what our goal is. So this has been a marvelous conversation, Soon, Thank you so much. I'm absolutely inspired by your work, and I look forward to seeing how it evolves. And um, thank you for um, all, all that you do. And I hope that we can continue this conversation in the future and continue to, to work together. Agreed. I look forward to our collaborations. It's amazing how we start into different places, but come together thinking about very similar kind of practices and issues. It's a great conversation. Thank you, Max. Thanks. Well, thanks for watching our video. You get more of that and my uh, articles uh, via links uh, in the video description. Please leave a like and subscribe to UBC Political Science for more from the department.